You'll know the first line of Genesis, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. But the way that that is also written is in the beginning was the logos. You may see now that there's some connection with the my use of logo uh, earlier as we were talking. The, what the logos is is it's the divine. It, it translates as the divine breath, uh, but it as a divine breath was the breath of God. And the breath of God had a special ability. What it could do was it could make things. So dogs, cats, uh, beaches, uh, oceans, planets. It's all made by God that week when he says, uh, or she says, let there be light. And then there was light. Let there be this and that. And biblically, the understanding is that it is the divine breath of God, the voice of God, boom, it happens. Now we have analogies to that in our in our human speech as well. Abracadabra, hocus pocus. But you can't make a chicken out of that. I mean, a magician does that, but it doesn't really cause anything. The, the biblical characterization is that when God does it, real stuff happens because his breath has the ability to do that. Um, humans can't do it. But they can do something else. If I tell you to close your eyes and uh, picture a Newfoundland dog running over a, a green field on a hill uh, with a blue sky and one cloud in the air, and as the dog runs, uh, his sides fly up in the air because he's so heavy, like two large uh, elephant uh, elephant ears. You may see that in your mind. And um, that's what I can do. What I can do is I can take thought in my head and I can turn it into thought in your head. And how do I do that? I do it with my semi-divine breath. And, and you do too, of course, all humans do. You do it with your semi-divine breath in this specific sense. You take the thought that is in you and you turn it into a vibration in the air. You do so with your larynx, etc. Now I can make sounds that aren't thoughts. I don't know if it's not a thought. Uh, but my everything else I'm doing is a thought. And it's a vibration that goes through the air. If there were no air in this room, you wouldn't hear me. And so instead, what it does is it goes into you and you turn it into a thought in your head. You take what I take, what is spiritually in my head, I turn it into air, and then you pick it up as a spiritual idea in your head. And uh, among those ideas can be the Pythagorean theorem, can be all the ideas in sociology, can be all the ideas in psychology, that's why they're called the logos, can be all the ideas in communicology, all the ideas in archaeology, and so on and so forth. And if you take all those ideas together, uh, I'll give you something that'll be helpful for your future. If you ask me what I am, well, I've done a variety of things. I play musical instruments, a whole bunch of stuff. But if I had to characterize what I did as a career and how my mind works, I can fix cars, and the, and I write in a variety of fields, but I would say largely the I am a communicologist. I'm a person who thinks and lives as a communicologist, and how did that happen? Well, I made myself into that over the years of reading and listening and studying the logoi of communication. That's and, and so when I talk to people and when I listen to people, I try to get the best Excuse me, I try to get the best stuff that I possibly can because I know that sentences are turning me into something. All the way through my life, sentences are turning me into something. They're causing me to see and think and feel. And if somebody tells me the Pythagorean theorem, that becomes part of the way I see the world. And if somebody tells me uh, the idea of the antilocution is a status diminishing utterance, that becomes some, one of the ways I see the world. And you give me enough of them in a specific field, and then I become a specialist in that field because I can see all kinds of stuff in, in that way. So this relationship between language, which we've been gifted with, the way we got it is God breathed into us to make us alive, supposedly. This is, this is the story. He makes Adam. Adam's nothing yet. So God, I mean, he's a material thing, but not a spiritual thing. So God breathed spiritual life into Adam. You find that in the, in the, in the Bible. 
And then Adam becomes a being. The first thing he does is he starts creating the human logoi. He runs around naming, naming, giving, uh, giving the lang la a, a, a lingu linguistic status to all living things. That's that's the big thing that we do. So what is the power of language in this sense? Now this is a little bit freaky, but I want you to um, I want you to uh, pay attention to it because uh, it's although it's strange, it's something that it's important for you to know. So this is this is obviously my hand, and I lost that I lost that middle finger in an accident uh, when I was three years old. It's a stump. I lost it when I was three. I lost it when I was three. I just want you to just listen to me say I lost that finger when I was three. I lost that finger when I was three. I lost that finger when I was three. Now, <laughs> I know you saw it on the way up too, but the, my purpose here was, was not to deceive you. I wanted to show you what the effect of language is. And in fact, in class, I get the students to bend their knuckles so that they can't see uh, that finger. And to say that to themselves, or I say it out loud, and several interesting things happen. One of them is that uh, there are a number of students who won't do it. Uh, then there's a number of students who will start doing it and stop and get awkward. And then the people who do do it, they jump back at a certain moment in revulsion. And it's because they can see, they see the world a new way. They see, they see themselves just suddenly as a being without that finger, and it freaks them out. And uh, it's the, the perception of reality is, is threatened. Uh, and I know it's a little bit distressing, but one of the things that language does that you have to, or excuse me, that studying does is it makes you realize things that you'd rather not at some level think about. You've been doing that from the time you were maybe two or three years old. Uh, people won't tell you the stuff that scares you, but university, you have to get this stuff. So. The reason you need to know this about language, that it has the power to cause you to see the world differently, is in part because of lying. Now, let me give you uh, uh, a couple of examples that are related to this. If somebody tells you they're going to be somewhere, somebody that you care about, and you invest your effort in them, and then you find out that they've betrayed you, during the time that you believed their lie, you saw a stump. And then all of a sudden, the finger pops up. Then you get scared that, you know, they're going to show you stumps again in the future. Here you have this magnificent thing, which is language, which can, which can make a finger disappear, right? You have this wonderful thing called language, and it's being, being used deceptively. What would you do? What makes language particularly special is because there are two things that, uh, there are two things that the Greeks felt made human beings special. The first was that they could know things like the Pythagorean theorem. These were ideas that were eternal in their minds, as I said, and they were able to touch the eternal. Try to explain the Pythagorean theorem to a dog or any other animal or to a rock. You can't. The human beings can, can, can dwell amid ideas so they can understand those things. The second thing that they could do that they knew was special is they could explain the Pythagorean theorem or any eternal idea to somebody else. And this gave language, human language, a profound spiritual status for them. Uh, and it always has, and it, it makes the, the ethics of language so substantial. Now, that we, if we go back to the n nature of philosophy, what can I know? What must I do? What you now know is that there is spiritual power in language. It, it shapes the minds of other people and the thoughts, and it can be used to transmit eternal ideas like the Pythagorean theorem. We'll go a little further in a second or two. It can, it can do those things, and you can do them because you've been gifted with them, whether through a god or just by evolution. And then you go through the grocery store, and this is what you hear with the human version of the divine breath from a microphone above you. Well, Bill, I don't know if you know it today, but I was walking through the shelves and I saw that, you know, potatoes are on for $1.95. They were $2.35 last week and they're $1.95 right now. That's a saving of 45 cents. Oh no, Tom, I can't believe that. The 45 cents, they've actually lowered the price of potatoes at 45 cents? Yes, they have, Bill, at the Real Atlantic, whatever, the IGA, Potatoes are now $1.95. And I think what's sad is when you watch 15 or 60 people running towards the potatoes. 
The world is no longer the place where the man makes the decision for truth or love. The noise makes man over. It makes man into the embodiment of its pseudo-thought. So instead of thinking about things like truth and love, instead of hearing things that speak of truth and love and other stuff as well, you hear about getting 40 cents off on a potato as if that's the most important thing in the world, or wearing a new pair of shoes that have been designed with a special heel that uh, that uh, says potatoes are 20 cents off every time it lands on the floor. None of the in fact, it'd be a good project for you to go around in the daytime and see how much noise you can hear, how many sentences that are nothing more than pseudo-thought. The stuff we're doing is thought, okay? None of the elemental phenomena of life, such as truth, loyalty, love, faith, can exist in this world of noise. The pseudo-thoughts become more important than the genuine thoughts. We'll go into that later on. But you can really see it in our tendency to prefer people of fashion to people of goodness. For these elemental phenomena must arise from the fertile soil of human silence. And what this means is basically there has to be a context in which people are listening to ideas like this. You're being silent right now. And as a result of your silence, you're participating with ideas, and uh, if you go away and you think about them in silence without other people interfering with them, they'll become part of you, and you'll notice this noise in others and so forth. I know people have already seen this video or already re reporting that kind of experience, and the ground of this silence has been salted by so much noise that no truth or beauty flowers from it. Thus, people stare at each other dimwittedly when challenged to say that anything that is more penetrating than a cliche, hey, what's up, how you doing, not too much going on, you know what I'm saying, you got a game, my game going on, and all of these expressions that I don't even know what they are anymore because I'm so out of touch. But uh, anyway, I think that's the point is, is clear there. But, but uh, the point is that why is that an ethical issue? Well, remember the two uh, characteristics of philosophy. What can I know? What must I do? For the Greeks, what you can know is about yourself is that you carry the you carry eternal thought. And since other beings don't carry eternal thought, in order for you to access eternal thought, part of you must be part of eternal thought. This is why they believed they were immortal. Well, not immortal, I shouldn't say, but this is why they believed there was a mortal spirit because they were able to contact it. They were they were in touch with the with the eternal. They were in touch with the Pythagorean theorem. So, other beings which do not have this could not be in touch that way. And that what this convinced them of was that uh, what this convinced them of was that uh, they had they, they had some spiritual responsibility. So that then they would what you must ask yourself is that if you have these two things. The capacity for eternal ideas and the capacity to share and put eternal ideas in other people. Do you want a job telling people that potatoes are 40 cents off? 